So what actually is an invasive plant? What does that mean? And why do certain plants get banned from sale in a particular state? Today, I'm going to try to tackle this subject and break it down so it's as easy to understand as possible so that you know what all of this means and what you can actually do about the invasive species issues that we're facing. And make sure you stick around to the end of this video because I'm going to share with you the top nine plants that can attract hundreds of butterfly, moth, and specialist bees to your garden. My name is Amy and over at Pretty Purple Door, I help home gardeners create landscapes that are uniquely you. And before we get started, I'd like to invite you to my three gardening secrets training. It's a free training and I'll leave the link in the description below so you can check it out. Now let's get on to the topic for today. So first you need to understand the difference between a non-native and an invasive plant and what a native is too. I have this article on my website. I'll share a link to it in the description below. Native plants are plants that belong in the particular region that you live in. That means they grow there naturally. They provide habitat and food for wildlife and they don't cause any harmful effects on the environment. A non-native plant is a plant that typically was brought into your region in some way, by a person, by accident, etc. If it weren't for that action, whether it was deliberate or not, that plant would never be growing in your region. And invasive plants are always non-native plants. So they've always been brought in or introduced in some way. And sometimes when non-native plants are introduced into a new habitat, they can take over and cause a lot of problems for your local ecosystem. In short, they're pretty bad news. So not talking invasive species here, but just think about if you were to introduce a tiger into the United States. They don't typically live here unless they're in a captive area. But if you brought one over here and just released it into the wild, what do you think might happen? Well, it might eat animals or do things that are destructive to the environment here because number one, it's not really from this environment, so it has to kind of adapt and figure out how to survive. And number two, the natural predators that it would have in its normal living area, they don't exist in the new environment. So another example would be a zebra. So if you brought a zebra here, would it do any damage at all? It's possible it wouldn't. It's possible it would. I don't really know the answer to that, but you can see how a zebra is more likely to just sort of exist in the United States and potentially not cause too much harm because it's kind of like a horse. Like it would might just fit in and do just fine. So that's sort of what happens with plants. There are some plants that are brought in from other areas that are non-native that aren't really damaging to the ecosystem in the same way that an invasive plant is. So an invasive plant is something that is just taking over. It's been deemed harmful to the environment because a lot of times, just like the tiger, it doesn't have those natural predators or natural diseases to keep it in check like it would be in another area. And that's why some plants can be invasive in certain locations and maybe not in other locations. It really just depends on the region that they're living in. So a non-native invasive plant would smother out native plants. And the native plants that are in your region are the ones that we're relying on for survival, not just little butterflies and caterpillars, not just the birds, but like us. The insects at the bottom of that food chain that feed off of the native plants, they're the ones that are transferring the energy from a plant to the vertebrates. So it becomes a really big problem when you start messing with something at the bottom of that food chain. And if we don't have the insects that are at the bottom, then it's gonna affect everybody moving forward. So that's the real issue with invasive plants and they're deemed invasive by scientific research. They're not just invasive to make you feel bad and to make it difficult for you to buy a burning bush because you want a burning bush. It's not how it works. It's really based on science and they're seeing that there are actual problems with those plants and they're disrupting the local ecosystem. So let's take the burning bush for example. I recently saw a post in a gardening Facebook group where people are going back and forth about the issues that occur with burning bush and some people weren't aware that this particular shrub is potentially invasive, especially in the eastern United States. 
So this is the burning bush. It is October when I'm recording this, so it's in its full glory and it's beautiful. Nobody's saying it's not a beautiful shrub. It's just really bad to have in your garden. And the reason is that burning bush reproduces seeds which are dispersed by birds to nearby woodland and meadows. Once established, these plants will form a dense thicket capable of outcompeting almost any native plant. So that's the issue that's happening with burning bush and a lot of the invasive species that you hear about. And I saw some people in the group saying, well, I see that it creates these little baby plants and I dig them up on my landscape. So therefore it's okay because I'm controlling the situation or other people have said, I haven't seen it spread. It's not spreading. I think that there's a misconception that a non-native or an invasive plant means that it spreads. And yes, that's true to an extent, but that's not really the true meaning of it. It's not just spreading. It's taking over native ecosystems and killing out all of the plants that are necessary to survive. So if you are somebody that has a burning bush and you're digging out those little baby plants and you're taking care of it and you're trying to do your part, that's great. But who is doing that when the bird carries the seed into the middle of the woods somewhere and drops it? That's the actual problem. It's not on your property. We have a responsibility as gardeners to respect the environment. And I know a lot of people have the opinion that I'm allowed to plant whatever I want. It's my property. And you know, to an extent that's not true because it's affecting the world around you. So so I think that most gardeners really do care about plants and the environment in general. So it shouldn't be a hard thing to grasp that you could be picking a plant and putting it on your property that's actually damaging the world around you. And I don't think most of us really want to do that. So you need to understand that it's not just little things that are popping up in your own yard. If they're in a space where there's not human intervention, like in the woods, those plants can really take over. And I'm sure a lot of you have read about the endangered species list adding monarch butterfly and I know that's a big deal for a lot of people and the reason that things like this happen are because monarch butterflies are specialist insects so they can only lay their eggs on milkweed and the problem with an invasive species is that it can potentially overrun native species <laughs> like a milkweed and that's the reason why the monarchs are becoming extinct. One of the reasons, I mean, there's many reasons why these things happen, but you have to kind of consider that it's being smothered out by a non-native plant that just doesn't have any checks and balances and it's sort of just overrunning that milkweed or whatever that plant is. So unfortunately, it's not just the monarchs that are specialist species. Uh, a lot of them are. 5% of native plants support 75% of the caterpillar population. And 14% of native plants support 90% of caterpillar populations. So there's invasives, which are very bad. And then there's non-natives, which aren't great, but a lot of them can survive, like a hosta. It's not detrimental to the environment to own hostas. The problem isn't really with non-native plants, it's with the lack of native plants because of these things like the specialist insects that can only host on certain types of plants. Doug Tallamy is a great resource for this type of thing. I read all of his books. I watch all of his talks. He's a very excellent source for more information on what I'm talking about. And he has a really strong view on supporting caterpillar populations in your landscape. So why caterpillars? It's because most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that eat plants. And most invertebrates are insects and most of these edible insects happen to be, you guessed it, caterpillars. So he thinks that the best way to support the ecosystem in our own gardens is by planting native plants that support caterpillar populations, especially specialist caterpillars that will only host on certain plants. Doug Ptolemy will call these keystone plants. 
And these keystone plants are definitely awesome plants that you should check out and they are specific to different eco regions within the United States. These are the plants that are kind of like the most bang for your buck when it comes to incorporating native plants into your own landscape. Now you might be saying why caterpillars? I want to support pollinators. Well pollinators are also very important because we need the pollinators to keep those flowering plants around so that we can support the life of the caterpillar. So I guess you're in luck if you want to support pollinators as well. The truth about pollinators is that 15 to 60 percent of North American native bee species are pollen specialists who will only eat pollen from 40 percent of native plants. So it's a little bit higher of a percentage with the bee population of the types of native plants that they will actually pollinate, but it's still not all of the native plants, which is where those keystone plants again come in. So it's definitely something that makes me think how many of these bees and different caterpillar butterfly species that are really specialists and they really need certain plants in order to survive and how much it affects everything around us because if they can't transfer that energy from plants to other animals, then we have a real problem here. And I think it's an awesome opportunity as a gardener to be able to actually change things and make things better around us and who doesn't want to do that right so you may be wondering how to actually find these keystone plants or the native species that will support the local ecosystem and I'm gonna leave a link to this website in the description below it's from the National Wildlife Federation and it's a keystone plants by eco region list so if you scroll down from this page you'll see a little map and then it gives you all of the eco regions within the United States and you'll have to choose the one that's right for you. You can actually blow up the map and then you can see a little more clearly. I'm here, Pennsylvania, I'm in this eight zone. So that's Eastern temperate forests. So you can just find your location on this map and then go back to that page and I can click on the Eastern temperate forest link to get all of the information about the native plants that I could potentially plant in my own landscape. And here it'll go through the type of plant, the genus, what the common species are. And this is also really awesome. It gives you the number of caterpillar species that use that particular plant as a host plant and also number of pollen specialists, bee species that rely on that particular plant. And you can see here that a white oak supports 436 caterpillar species. So that's a really good choice if you have the space for it. But there's even smaller plants like a Coreopsis. It's a beautiful plant. And you can see here it's going to still support seven butterfly species and 22 pollen specialist bees. So that's a great option. A lot of, on this list are things that you can consider based on what your own ecological preferences and what you want to support, but all of them are good choices that you'll find on these lists. So in the December 2022 edition of Fine Gardening Magazine, there's an article in here. It was an interview or conversation with Doug Tallamy by Christine Alexander, and there was a lot of really helpful information in this article. I will link to it in the description below. And also in the article, there was a list of plant picks that will support wildlife. And I'm just gonna read off the list. There's only nine of them on this list and they're great options if you don't feel like doing extensive research. These are a few that you can try out. And we have the top herbaceous plants being goldenrod or solidago, aster species or sunflower, which are the wild sunflower. Helianthus is the scientific name. And under top woody plants, oak is obviously at the top of that. Cherry, willow, birch, American elm, and cottonwood. And I'll put the list on the screen here so you can see that. But it's a great option to try to incorporate some of these native plants into your landscape so that you can give back. And of course, if you have invasive plants on your property, I'd highly recommend doing that research to find out. You can always just do a simple Google search before you buy anything or any of the plants that you already have. You can search is blank plant invasive in blank in your state and you'll usually be able to find that information. I always do this when I'm at the garden center and I see a plant I've never heard of before. I wanna know, first of all, is it native? And if it's not native, is it invasive? And then I weigh the pros and cons of the benefits of that plant as far as 
four season interest, my own needs and my own desires to help the local ecosystem around me. If it is native, I also look it up to see if it's on that keystone list. I am always on the hunt for these plants that have the highest bang for your buck as far as how many insects and butterflies will host and use that plant. So it's definitely kind of like next level gardening to me. I feel like it's a really fun activity and it makes me feel good to know that I'm doing something to benefit the environment. I hope that this describes everything in a simple way that you can understand so that it's not so strange when people People say something is invasive, now you kind of understand what that means and what you can do about it. And if you have questions, definitely leave them in the comments below or check out the resources I left down in the description. And I'll see you over in the next video.